PTL coming at you. Good Wednesday, everybody. Welcome once again to BTL Bass Talk Live, where we're going to talk bass fishing and anything else that we want to talk about. Matthew, how you doing? I'm seeing a lot of sunset pictures from 10 Killer, Mark. You know what that means. What does that mean? They're not catching them. <laughs> well, now since you mentioned that, I actually had an opportunity to talk to a guy that probably knows that lake as good, not as good, but pretty darn close to Jason Christie, and that, that is the Ed Barton Now, you fished night. the old man's trail. Is that what it is? I that don't want to f- offend anybody. What is it called? <laughs> it's like a, a Tuesday during the day sometimes. Yeah, we just, that's what we call and it. And you fish with Ed, and yeah. a lot of times it's on 10 Killer, and I always say, well, what are you guys going to do? And Mark always goes, I don't know, whatever Ed wants to. Yeah, he's the man. He's the man out there. He's one of the guys, you know, he lives right on the Arkansas River, but lives, you know, a half an hour away from 10 Killer, has fished it his entire life. And he was pretty open about what he feels is going to go down this week. And Friday, Matthew, Friday is going to be the day. That's just because it's going to be a topwater day, and that's your favorite thing to do. No, 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 no. I did not say that. He said that. He said that. He said that. 12,000 acres. Uh, Obviously, we're talking about the final regular season Elite Series stop on Lake Ten Killer, a 12,000 acre fishery. You got your FM voice working again. Is it Eastern Oklahoma? (laughs) What would you call it? Eastern Oklahoma? You can't get much Easterner than that. So. What are you talking about, man? Yeah, yeah, it's Eastern. No, where'd you think it was? Out the panhandle? You do realize that I, <laughs> I do not know my cardinal directions, right? <laughs> you are geographically challenged, aren't you? Yeah, Harold Allen used to always be. <laughs> what, what would you do, Matthew, if that little GPS stopped working? I said, well, I have a backup GPS. What if that would stop uh, working? I would say I would just drive. Yeah, yeah. So anyway, uh, Ed... Gave me some really, really good insight. I know a lot of the guys have been struggling in practice, uh, but Friday is going to be the day, and it's going to be tough on Thursday. It's tough in practice right now. Well, they shouldn't really be griping because the alternative was Fort Gibson, which wasn't exactly going to be a slugfest either. I think it would have been better than a lot of people thought simply because there hasn't been a lot of pressure on that lake because of the high water. It still sucks in (laughs) the end of September. (laughs) No, you're right. You're right. But uh, we had the the discussion about smallmouth, and I don't know how much smallmouth are going to come into play. 16 inches. Yeah. I know they do like to come up and smash a topwater every now and then on that pond. So we'll it'll see. be a good one to see. There's a bunch of different stuff they can do considering how small it is. And, yeah. you know, everyone's talking about it. it's a deep, clear water. But there is a lot of variety on that lake that you could have different guys doing different stuff yeah. all make the final day. Now, I made the comment that the river was going to come into play. I asked Ed about that. He said, yes, but only one day. He said, there is no way with the water dropping that anybody's going to be able to put together a plan for the river for four days and be able to win out of the river. So it's, he said, damn the river. We'll see. You agree with that? Damned a river? Yeah, I don't I have not spent a lot of time up in that river, so yeah. I don't really know the river much. I mean, I go down and I go, I throw an Alabama rig. So you've rig. never been past the bridge. That's it. Listen, if you ever went past the bridge. On 10 killer, I throw an Alabama rig, a drop shot, a top water, and a Ned rig. Okay. And I like to stay around Chicken Creek. So you have never been past the bridge? No, I've been past the bridge. Okay. But I just don't know it like Turn Ed does. I'll just stick with what Ed says. <laughs> you know, so we got another headset sitting here today. I think we, we have another in studio guest today. That's three in the last two weeks. We had yeah. Zaldane uh, Monday of last week, and then Brad Holman in studio after the Open on Grand as he yeah. prepares for the upcoming Costa and U.S. Open, and then uh, a long overdue guest that we talked about yeah. yesterday, Zach Burge. Looking forward to it. Uh, right here in Oklahoma, actually lives in. A community of which I was the head basketball coach at the high school in that community for a number of years. Did you ever and get kicked out of any of those games? No, no. That was after the Bobby Knight yeah, days? Yeah, okay. yeah. I had mellowed a little bit. So, uh, had a decent year on the BPT. We're going to 
get his thoughts on that and what he has going on. He's very busy outside of the fishing industry, too. Yeah, always been a, uh, I guess the term is a, hus- a hustler or a innovator. <laughs> like, I mean, he's always had some, some, something go, you know, like a something yeah. going, like different, yeah. like smaller businesses, whether it be in the hunting or the yeah. fishing with groups of guys. Uh, so good stuff. I'm also won a ton. I mean, between the yeah. BFLs and the and the college national championship, the Costa yeah. championship, uh, FLW two a rookie of the year. Remember, he started out. He he went on there and uh, just off the top of my head, like three or four top tens in the yeah. first five tournaments, or three yeah. or four top thirties in the first five tournaments, and then almost won Red Crest had it not been for the Edwin <laughs> Edwin Evers hole and change of venue. Swing he had that- <laughs> separated himself after the first two days of competition before he was. Yeah. brought back to the remaining 19 anglers yeah uh, a lot of people are giving you props for the fact that you throw the alabama rig yeah do you know how Mike fun it New is York. to chuck the alabama rig up on a pea gravel point in five foot and have a three pound small i'm with just you man torpedo it i'm with you it's fun it is fun i was reading got somewhere that right. it was some it, it might have even been another podcast or something where they were talking about is it time to bring the alabama rig back now that it is no longer the end all be all and use it as another tool and let yeah. the major tours use it in competition. I don't know. So I, it, I don't know if I listen yeah, to it, but maybe. it's just an interesting Can you point. use it in the nation stuff? No, can't use it in the Bass Nation. Can use it in the Costa series. Uh-huh. However, uh you have to either abide by state laws or a maximum of three hooks, two teasers, four blades. I What's believe. the state law in Oklahoma? You can use five. I think you can maybe even use more than what that. about Missouri? I don't know. I just don't know. With, I just I got three. What you do is you get those little uh, owner center pins and then yeah. screw those on the top two. Yeah. Put your dummy plastics on it and then you got your three on the bottom with the weights so it runs right. I mean, it's shocking how many times they they actually eat the right baits when yeah. you get it rigged up right and it doesn't tangle as much. Yeah. No, that's a good point. So, all right. I'm already working on next week's show. Uh, we have not discussed Matthew. The announcement of the 2020 Elite Series schedule. So we're going to talk about that next week. I thought it'd be a great idea to get Elo, Eric Lopez, with BASS on the show. Hopefully he will engage in our invitation and join the show, talk a little bit about how the schedule sets up and some of the challenges, some of the cool things that he went through in putting together the schedule Mm -hmm. and kind of break down and get the viewer's thoughts and some of the angler's thoughts on the schedule for next year. So we know the schedule for FLW, but we don't know where the cup is. We know the schedule for the Elite Series now, but we don't know where the Classic is. Right? No, it's in Birmingham. No, net for 2021. (laughs) No. (laughs) And, but we're so, uh, the Bass Pro Tour is the only schedule out. Now, I've seen the date, I've seen the sheet that has the dates blocked out, but still working on solidifying. For the BPT? Yeah. Oh, that's out? I didn't even realize that. No, it's not out. out. I've got the sheet where the. (laughs) Dates are blocked out as to where oh, wh- where oh, it is. It doesn't oh, say oh. where it is. It just says when it is. So is there overlap? Did you I, look to see if there I was overlap? I haven't gone back. I'm just curious. Done I mean, that ciphering yet? You think you might have that available for the show next week? Maybe I might have that available for the show next week. Is that public week. knowledge? No. Huh. Okay. All it is is just a 12 month calendar thing, and then there's dates blocked out. I have okay. no idea where they are or what they are. Okay. Well. I think we discussed many times on this show about how overlap is an issue. Yes. For multiple parties involved. Yes. So we'll see. Anyway, there's a there's a comment on the instant feedback from Brad in Tennessee. He said, When do you think the double A versions will be live streamed of all events? It's a good question. I mean, honestly, you, you could probably do it right now because there are platforms out there. FLW that you could do doing it at the Coast of Championship. The biggest, the biggest issue is you have to have connectivity, and wherever they have the weigh-ins at, unless they have a 4G connection or somehow, some way, they could run a DSL connection or a, you know, some type of Ethernet connection. Unfortunately, it seems like. Hey, we do it from the desert, for crying out loud, at the U.S. Open, so I guess you could do it everywhere. There's a trade-off here, because you want flawless streaming and connectivity. Your trade-off is you're ruling out probably 30% of the best lakes in the country. Because? There's no service out there. Yeah. It's really hard to do that. And then 
to do it at that level to get it to where there is service costs a lot more money, yeah. which is justifiable on a Bass Pro Tour level or Elite Series or Tour level. But yeah. then you get down to an Open or Coastal level, and it's is that justifiable I, for know, all that money it, to stream it? If you had connectivity, you could do it, and it wouldn't cost thousands and thousands of dollars. But the other thing is, is what level of streaming do you want to have? Do you want to have a play-by-play guy? Do you want to have a color guy? Do you want to have multiple cameras? Do you just want to set a camera up and feed the mic off of the speaker system? And there's guys who are doing it at that level now, too. I know the, the uh, Costas and the Opens, I believe. Are the Opens allowing it? Live streaming? During oh, from the tournament? The, from the, yeah, I don't know. like what Carl I have no idea. Jockinson does and stuff. Yeah, I mean, I if you know. really, yeah, I know you do it because uh, I know some anglers who tried to do it on Facebook Live this year during the Open. Yeah. How many people do you think would watch a BFL weigh in? Well, you can go watch a BFL weigh in right now on FLW. I, I'm just asking you, how many people do you think would watch a BFL weigh in? If there's 100 in it and they have five friends and family, a couple hundred people maybe, a, yeah. B, a BFL but, weigh in? I guess the point I'm trying to make yeah. is. Uh, would people in Birmingham be interested? Is the expense justifiable for all yeah. the effort that it takes? Do you know. think that they would be interested in the weigh-in at Grand Lake for an Okie Division BFL? No. Maybe? No. <laughs> I, there's 90 BFLs going on. I don't care what they're doing in, on the James River in June when I'm in Oklahoma. If you're one of the handful of guys that may have a national event there, you might be interested. One of the handful. Is that the cost yeah, it, justifiable? Exactly. So I don't know. Is there... A, is there opportunities out there to do that? Yes, but once again, it's a cost factor. Hey, here, here's an interesting question. How did Tin Killer get its name? I don't know. I have no idea. That's I, I will have grade. to. You want to get yeah. to the, the other big news? Yeah. And we wrap need up to, the we, first segment? And then, and then we'll take a break and come back with our in-studio guest. What what's the big news, man? I figured you wanted to be the one. To no, you on can this. say no. it. <laughs> uh, press release came out yesterday through Bass as Toyota extends sponsorship of Bassmaster events through 2023. Uh, Bass is looking forward to four more years with Toyota, said uh, Bruce Aiken. Um, the agreement includes Toyota sponsorship of the 50th Bassmaster Classic, as well as the Elite Series, the Opens, the College Series, the High School Series. The Bass Nation. Everything. The regionals. Just yeah. say everything. <laughs> and we'll continue the family-friendly and vehicle displays. And we'll be on all of Bass's multimedia platforms. Yeah. A couple things I got from that press release. One, I don't know if you realize this or not. They do not do four-year deals. That is huge. And when I say they, I'm talking about big companies, Toyota. Well, that's a three-year deal. Did they not say four years? Through 2023? Let's see here. One, two, three, four. No. They already had a contract in place through this year. So 2020, 2021, 2022, 2023. Yeah. In it's yeah. Uh, into Am I right? 2020, 2021, 2022, 2023. Yeah. That's four into years. Into 2023. Yeah. Toyota is thrilled to continue our exclusive partnership with Bass into 2023. That's four years. Said Matt Azawa. <laughs> OZAWA from Toyota North America. Yeah, that's a commitment. That's a big time commitment, and uh, it, it's great for everybody that, that decides to go that route and get, you know, gets involved and aspires to be on the Elite Series and everything. Uh, I'm really curious to see how the format or what they're going to do for the Opens. Mm-hmm. Has that been announced yet? Nope. It said I believe they said when I was watching the Open weigh in. Yeah. In a couple weeks. I think is what Chris yeah. Rose might have said not to quote him. but You know what I'm going to stand or, up for, Matthew? Take a guess. When they announce this, whatever it is, what do you think I'm going to stand up for? A West Coast swing. That is correct. I am sticking up for you West Coast guys. Hey, if you can get 250 people to fish in the U.S. Open, by gosh, you should be able to get 100 to fish in an Open out in the West with an opportunity to be a part of the Bassmaster Elite Series. And once again, when the announcement is made and there is no West Coast presence, then I'll get on my soapbox. Enough said. That'll work. Have you ever looked underneath these press releases? It's kind of intriguing. What's that? You know, last month I owned over 
14,586 by working online from home from my free time. <laughs> click here for more. Thanks a lot. And then you can is that, click on That's it. not clickbait, is oh, it? Oh, it's 100% spam. <laughs> but I mean, if you're targeted it, yeah. that looks pretty lucrative. $14,000 a month working from home. I'm trying to fish. I'm clicking on that. <laughs> From your computer. Did you, did you click on it already? From your computer, I where, will. Where did it, Maybe that's why the computer doesn't work. I'm, yeah, it's all that other stuff you've been looking at, Matthew. Yeah. Jeez. All right. Uh, so that's kind of the plan for next week. We will get in in depth into the schedule, and then hopefully soon uh, we will hear from the MLF guys to see what their schedule is going to be next year not a work hopefully soon be back with uh we probably got zach like a couple weeks before he disappears into woods and on the water and yeah for a sev- several month period yeah all right we're gonna take a break come back with zach burge right here in studio everybody stay tuned serious about catching fish that hds is a dead giveaway you've got the best fish finding sonar money can buy time to build the ultimate fish finding system with live sight sonar see what your lure is doing in real time watch fish strike as it happens see for yourself take the live sight sonar 30-day challenge if live sight sonar doesn't help you find and catch more fish send it back no questions asked John McGod's the G Finesse Series. In my opinion, the G Finesse Series is the only lineup of hooks you need for any fishing you do. But I know a lot of guys haven't used this hook yet. <laughs> G Finesse Series has the nano coat on the hooks. And the nano coating makes the hooks sharper, smoother, for a better hookup ratio. 20% stronger than black nickel. Wow, that is incredible. Uh, that's a lot of strength. My Gamakatsu G Finesse Series perfect finesse fishing for you check out the g finesse series of hooks by gamagatsu Guys, Gerald Swindle, Sunline Pro Staff. If you're a flipper, a slight line hook setter, you're really putting a lot of impact into your hook set, look for the shooter. It comes off the smooth, really smooth. Like when you're flipping, it is smooth. If you're going to be drop shotting and cranking, sniper's the deal, man. It's, it seems like it's a little bit less likely, like on a, on a shark hook set, it doesn't seem like it likes it as much. But for coming off the spool on spinning rod, leaders, cranking, like if I'm going to throw a big plug at Gunnersville, I've still got strong, strong tensile strength that's not going to give out on me, but yet the line's thin enough that it get down. So to me, shooter takes a hook set, snipers for everything else. So if you're going to slack line them, go shooter. The name Spro says it all. Spro stands for Sports Professional. When you look at the, the pro staff that Spro has brought on board over the past 15 years, it's been pretty incredible. And I mean, one got it just then. From the development of the rock crawler to the McStick, from the fat pop of the Little John series, when you tie a Spro bait on, you know it's been designed by a professional to get the job done. Blue Water by TH Marine. Offering LED lighting solutions for your boat, trailer, truck, ATV, and so much more. Engineered and built to be rugged with waterproof and submersible options. Designed for easy installation, Blue Water is available in a variety of colors and styles. All backed by a limited lifetime warranty. Blue Water by TH Marine. At Duckett Fishing, we have assembled the top pros in the country to help us design rods to give you a competitive advantage. Castability, strength, durability, 
Action. Sensitivity. Weight and balance. And consistency. Combine that with the best warranty in the industry, and you have rods that are pro-driven. Duck at Fishing. Pro-driven. Hey guys, Cliff Perch here with AFCO. I've got the new Camo Hooded Reaper. It's gonna be a great thing both for fishing and hunting this fall. I can tell you a couple of the features about it. Got the face mask like all the Reapers do, vented in front. It's got the fleece on the inside, so it's really comfortable. It's super warm. When you come down to the pocket, it's got this little snap system called block tapey, and it's silent. You know, it doesn't make that sound that other, other snaps and other systems that hook it together make. Great for hunting, and it's gonna keep that stuff in your pocket. I got my power pole down Stuck in the mud in the bottom of the lake Sitting so still in the wind and the waves Could even be a hurricane I got my power pole down All right, we are back, wrapping up the week here on a Wednesday. We have our special in-studio guest once again. Very excited to have Zach Burge in studio. How you doing, man? Good, good. Long time coming, uh, Oklahoma pro. And what's really cool is I want to kind of dive into the beginning of you deciding that this is what you wanted to do in your career. Uh, it, it sounds like, at least from what I've heard, I want to hear it from you, though, that uh, when you were a little kid and even when you were in school, as you progressed through school, you had in mind that this is what you wanted to do with your life. So kind of talk a little bit about how that whole thing came about. Yeah, it's, um, you know, everybody wants to be a professional fisherman. I think that's kind of a, you know, if you fish ponds, if you know just being a kid you want to fish uh and you look up to the guys that are doing it professionally and i've always been that kid um never did i really think it would be something i would end up doing um and one thing kind of led to another i got through high school we did not have high school fishing at the time which was unfortunate um but i got into college and got into college fishing and that's something i did with you know which is one of my best friends today uh we fished college fishing at Oklahoma State. We're fortunate enough to win a championship. And that's kind of when it all came to light. Like, hey, you know, I actually have a chance at this now. So, you know, it's just kind of like it's rolled into what it is today with a few good fortunate events. All right. I know the college thing obviously was important. But when you were in high school, high school has grown into just its own gigantic entity right now. When you were in high school, though, did you think about it? Did you think about becoming a pro when you were in high school, or did that not happen until college? Not really until college. Okay. I mean, when I was in high school, I was worried about my coach getting on to me and catching me for <laughs> ditching practice <laughs> to go fish a pond. Really? Yeah. So what would you play in high school? Basketball and baseball. Okay. You were uh, at a high school that one of my favorite players uh, that, to come out of the state of Oklahoma in the history of high school basketball, Ryan Spangler. Did you play with Ryan? I did. Yeah, I was. Uh, I got to play with Ryan for at least three years of basketball. He was just a freak, wasn't he? 
that kid could play. <laughs> <laughs> Where's Matt's he heard the is call. He in like Europe or something? No, he he's back in Oklahoma now. Oh. Mm-hmm. Yeah, he played in China for a little while and then came back and now he's I think he's working with his dad has a construction company or something yep. that he's working with his dad. There's like a game Jeffries was doing. He had a brief career as a play-by-play commentator. And Spangler fouled out <laughs> on an over-the-back foul, and Jeffries went absolutely ballistic. And we we play we played that clip over and over again. It was this it was the about, highlight of his play-by-play. It was about career. ten years ago. It was a long time ago. That's five. That's time. He, he, great guy, super nice guy, and uh, loves the outdoors. Loves to fish. And I are are you surprised by the expansion and the growth of high school and college fishing? Uh, no, I think it's, I mean, it's, it's great that it's blown up to what it is today. I wish it had done it a little earlier so I could have got, got in on some of it. Yeah. The success that you had early in your career, uh, Matt and I talk about it all the time. We talk about momentum. We talk about, uh, you know, the, the confidence that comes with success. How have you dealt with, and and this is my side and Matt's going to deal with the other side. How have you dealt with the times that success really hasn't been there, especially being a young angler. Um, everybody gave me crap about being in a sophomore slump after I came out of mm-hmm. my freshman year on tour, um, and I just thought it was a joke. Everybody was giving me a hard time, and sure enough, I had my sophomore slump, uh, yeah. and it was pretty. It was pretty tough. It was humbling for sure. Um, you know, but I also got into doing things that I shouldn't have done, like listening to too much doc talk, doing, you know, fishing this way because I hear this is what you're supposed to do when you come to this body of water. Things that a young, you know, guy just getting his feet wet in there at that level would do. Um, you know, everybody wants to be your friend at the time. They're all telling you, here, go do this, go do that. I'm like, okay, I'll go do this. And I end up not catching nothing. Um, and it took about halfway through the third year to – realize that hey how did i get here fishing the way i like to fish i'm gonna go back to fishing the way i like to fish and i started catching them again and it's just that's how i've always been that's what got me to the tour to begin Mm with i just had to you know realize what was going on what i was doing wrong that's a great great example of what people can take from that story and actually apply to what they're doing and how they're trying to develop their careers especially when they have success because you did you had an enormous amount of success and it's great to hear how you are trying and how you have overcome the adversity that you've seen your sophomore season what year did you win the college national championship 12? 12. 2012. So you have the College National Championship in 12. Then you win the, the Costa Championship in 14, a BFL in 15, and then a Costa Series in 16. How important is it for a, a young angler like you coming up to have the wins? How much do the wins propel your career as opposed to, do you think you'd be where you'd be if those were second place finishes in that? Or is there something big about a win when it not only comes to the confidence and the sponsors and the money? Uh, wins are extremely important. Um, that's just, that's just as simple as it gets. I wouldn't be where I am today without those wins. Um, especially the college um, and the Costa or Ravac championship at the time. Those two were probably the biggest two. Um, I haven't won in a while. It's it's kind of getting frustrating, you know. <laughs> I like I like to win. Everybody that's competitive likes to win. Um, I thought I had a good shot at that not a couple weeks ago, but, um, you know, we fight hard every day. We'll get another one. Did you realize how important those wins were at the time, or does it take – a year or two of not winning and then some perspective in the industry to realize how important those wins are um definitely at the time i didn't realize how important they were and now looking back on it knowing how the industry works um it's been a game changer for me wow all right now i know the the mlf season is not complete there's still uh, one or two cup events left, but at least from the BPT standpoint, how would you summarize your performance this year on the initial BPT? Uh, I, I'm happy with it. You know, it's it's. I didn't really know what to expect. I'd had a little bit of history with select events in the past, so I knew the platform, knew how it would play out, but I didn't know 
how I would stand up against a bunch of the anglers that I was fishing against this year. Um, but I'm happy with the way it, it ended up. Um, but I, I went back to fishing the way I like to fish. And it, it's always been, for me, this platform, the way we fish right now and this is the way I've always fished. I've always been someone to go out and catch as many fish as I can catch in one day and try to play a numbers game and let that play out versus I'm going to go catch five today. You know, that's just not who I am. I've always tried to cash a check, number one, so I can mm-hmm. – pay my way to get to the next one um you know such it's just worked out good for me how much time at least the time that you spent off the off the water and then also when you didn't have an event going on the time that you spent on the water how much did your your practice your uh dedication to uh, i i don't know preparing yourself for this format did you go through in this first season um if any i haven't changed anything um you know going back to the years past when you've got three days of practice i still practice the same way now as i did then Mm -hmm. now i've only got two days and i'm going you know my number one goal is just trying to figure out how to generate a bite that's that's it you know i'll fish it i'll cover as much water in practice as i can i'll run all the way down the lake fish it try to see everything visually and you know try to pinpoint those areas where i can get the highest percentage of bite generation now you growing up have fished a bunch of different lakes in oklahoma i know i mean i've I've been at boat ramps just randomly you're always out there fishing with buddies on different types of lakes you've got a great network of guys where they're biting i mean you fish a lot of diverse stuff across oklahoma has that helped you in your first year on the bpt as well yeah absolutely it's helped me now and and, you know even back in college um being from oklahoma we have the arkansas river i grew up on the arkansas river in arkansas um you know but being here we have the arkansas river we have deep clear lakes we have muddy whatever you want to call them uh you know it's real diverse and uh it helps you become a well-rounded angler um, for traveling the country and seeing all these different places. Do you like fishing? And, and this is, I'm sorry, people, I'm being a little greedy, greedy here. Have you ever fished or do you like to fish the uh, Lawton area lakes like Humphreys and Duncan and Fuquay and, and all those? I've spent some time down there. Do you like those? Uh, when they're biting, I do. They're challenging, aren't they? they? And that's kind of the point that I wanted to make is, does it make you better to practice and and actually try and and catch those fish on those tough bodies of water does that improve your game absolutely zach have you is, ever been there zach isn't naming the good lakes around lawton well, <laughs> he doesn't want to yeah. blow them out of the water right now that's why he's smiling isn't it i hunt a little bit down there so we can stay away from that area <laughs> <laughs> i i i mean there was a period of time way before you were born probably that there was a lake down there that I mean, multiple, multiple double-digit double, double digit fish were caught and became just the entire fishing community of Oklahoma kind of saturated. Uh, Fuqua. Oh. Yeah. Yeah, I've heard of that. They yeah. still have some tournaments out there, but it's never been. Yeah. Like I mean, back in the day, it was, it got pounded, pounded, but it just kept pumping out double-digit fish and then something happened. And I always go to Latonka and try to catch big smallmouth and yeah. I always zero. Yeah. Or yeah. catch like one. It's... Latonka's kind of weird. It's got some really big largemouth in it, yeah. and uh, supposedly it's got big smallmouth. I've never seen one get caught, but um, a friend of mine told me a few years ago the state took a pile of them. They shocked it up and took a pile of them over to Murray because evidently when they stocked Murray with smallmouth, yeah. they put the wrong strain in it or something. They put the ones that are about that big around <laughs> yeah. and about yeah. that long, Yeah, and they look like walleye. Yeah. So I'm sure that's probably a while Tonka hasn't been put in. I mean, well, we just caught a state record there, what, yeah. a couple years ago. Yeah. That was almost nine yeah. pounds. So. All right, I want to go to the instant feedback. Jim in Indiana, this is his comment. Zach, in my opinion, luck is much more uh, predominant in the MLF format than the traditional five fish format. What are your thoughts? Uh, I mean, yeah, you're going to get lucky at, at both sides of it. It's I don't think it's so much more important with the mlf than it is the five bass format you know um if anything i would say it's probably less important um 
because you got to you can't you can't take five minutes off your day um, and not be catching fish in MLF format. You'll get behind. You'll fall. I mean, even when you crank up and run, mm-hmm. and you sit down and stop, you're going to lose places. With a five bass format, I mean, it's not time isn't. It's important, but it's not. I'm not going to say it's not as important, but it doesn't directly affect you as quick as it would. So I, luck kind of is a weird thing for that. Okay. One of the things I've always noticed about you just following you on social media and stuff, whether it be your truck or your tackle or your boat or even like what you wear on tournament days, like it's like everything is like super meticulous with you. Like it has to be exactly, is that a fair assessment? Oh yeah, that's fair. (laughs) I mean, there's different levels of that. Talk about, is that all part of your preparation to success on the water? Yeah. I mean, if I don't vacuum my boat out the night before and have it like clean to the T, I don't feel right the next day. Man, teach this guy some lessons, okay? Because he needs to get on that bandwagon. There, there's the Burge camp and there's the Creek camp. They both catch fish. I fall somewhere in the middle. Yeah, I, I just, uh, you know, it, I'm kind of OCD on, you know, having things clean and organized and put together. And I know where everything's at. Um, you know, I pretty much dedicate my off day to cleaning my truck, cleaning my boat. That's, that's pretty much it. I, I remember I remember at a BFL one time in 2013, I looked at my colleague there and I said, I'm pretty sure he matched his shoes to the pinstripe in his bass cat. Oh, jeez. <laughs> Maybe. <laughs> jeez. All right. On that note, Andy in Indiana wants to know, how long did it take you to clean your boat after being pulled out by the airboat? Um, it was actually, that's the first time I'd ever been pulled out by an airboat. Um, I did put a cover on it that one of our official boats had. But that, the airboat was so far up in front of the boat when he was pulling it out, all he was doing was spraying, you know, mist from the water on it. It didn't get any sand in it. Okay. So the boat, I mean, it was it was clean still. <laughs> I run it back. I run it back wide open as soon as they pulled me out. Everything was fine. I didn't even have to vacuum it out. Is that a weird deal? I mean, are you more likely in the Bass Pro Tour to take more risks, to push farther, to get in tighter places? Because, I mean, I... I the way I understand it, you can get stuck, they'll come get you, you can get a backup boat, and then you just have to stop fishing. So really, it's getting into it and then worrying about getting out whenever the heck you get out, right? Yeah, yeah, I mean, pretty much. It's not, you don't have to worry about running back to a check-in time or being late or, you know, having a penalty for that. You just have to take a penalty for getting out of the boat, I guess. So have you found that you're more likely to push further back and explore more crazy stuff absolutely is that that's got to be kind of cool i don't i don't think twice about trying to push in somewhere that's super shallow and getting stuck i mean if i think there's a fish back there and i can see where i want to go i'm going to go to it yeah different kind of strategy all right frank in michigan wants to know how much more stress is involved fishing a bpt event compared to other formats oh man i said it from the very first select event i fished it's a whole different um it's a whole different game um just hearing updates all day that that's the most stressful part of it um you you catch up then you start falling and then you think i've got to move so you make an adjustment you catch back up somebody else passes you you know it's just it's a bouncing around game all day and like i said earlier if you if you let up for five minutes or you decide to sit down i want to run to this end of the lake you're going to fall behind and then you're playing catch up all day and it's it's just so hard to get up top and stay up top um it's it's stressful to say the least all right you mentioned score tracker i'm curious we've had this conversation on this show and it was based upon what the fans said it was actually a suggestion by a fan what would you feel about the fact that when you got the updates you got the score updates but you didn't have the angler's name with it what would you think about that uh i other than, and this goes back to what you said a little while ago about being kind of picky on everything, I try to pay real good attention to who I see, where they're at on the lake, whether I'm running down to a different section, I see people, you know, I just, there's, you know, somebody, there's somebody. Mm-hmm. I put it in my head, and then if I see them run by, it's the same thing. That way I know if they're catching them, I know kind of where they were at, maybe what they were doing. 
Um, so if we don't know who they are, but know their weights, you know, that'll kind of change that up a little bit. I personally wouldn't mind it. Um, I would just know that I'm getting behind and need to do something different. But, you know, if, if a guy's smart with the format we have right now, you'll pay real good attention who runs by you and who right. you run by. And hence, I think that's where the fan came up with that idea is yeah. it's kind of like, okay, well, you're addressing – Who's catching what? If you saw him, okay, you know maybe, or you think that you should be doing a different pattern or in a different area, whatever. It's right. just uh, I I kind of like the idea. It I is, think it's kind of cool. Good, yeah. All right, um, Josh the Painter. <laughs> That's his. I handle. remember Josh the Painter. Yeah, he calls he in. Yeah, he wants to know. Uh, did you have to change any of your lure? tactics or any type of pattern tactics obviously based upon the event going from the five fish to the mlf format nothing there you have it nothing at all and you're not the first guy to say that either yeah it, it just goes back to me trying to generate bites you know i i fish ways and i fish things that i'm gonna get a bunch of bites throughout the day and that's the yeah. way i've always been so i haven't had to change anything yeah we talk about mentors we we spent an entire segment about mentors if you had a mentor or has has there been somebody in this industry an angler or somebody that, that is not uh, an angler that has really inspired you and helped you out in this gig oh man uh I can't really pinpoint one for that. I mean, mm -hmm. I've watched, I've watched everybody from FLW for years to Bass, you know, and I've paid real close attention to all those guys. So, you know, I, it wouldn't be fair to all of them if I picked one. All right. How well did you know, uh, you know, coming up mainly through FLW? How well did you know a lot of those guys that are that are on the BPT now, the uh, Kevin Skeets, Aaron's, or was there some of those guys that? I mean, this was kind of your your year, your first introduction to those anglers. Yeah, I really didn't. I mean, other than a f couple of younger guys, I really didn't have any conversation with any of them. You know, it's, I never. You know, I don't know them on a mm -hmm. friend basis. Um, it was just. Those are the guys I've always watched on TV, you know, so it's, it's been cool. Did you talk to him throughout the year? I mean, yeah, yeah, yeah. Who'd, yeah you get to, who'd you get to know? Who was the most you were like, ah, I didn't think that dude would be cool, <laughs> but he's actually all right. Um, <laughs> oh, man. You know, we, we've had a, a bunch of our, yeah. We don't want to get you in trouble, man. <laughs> I got to watch what I say here. <laughs> uh, no, we've had a lot of uh good times dinners and meetings and things like that where i've got to you know talk with a bunch of them and get to know them better um they all they're all cool for the, for <laughs> politically the, correct answer for the most part uh were you in awe at any time seeing these guys i mean it, it, was there any even a little bit of intimidation the uh, first time that you showed up to the ramp at that well, first I mean, event? Well, he's been fishing against Thrift and Dudley I, and well, Scott that, Martin. That is a different animal, though. It's a different animal, Matthew. No, no it's not. No. Don't think so? No. I, I mean, I'm not, I'm not more intimidated fishing against Kevin as I was Thrift. You know, they're both phenomenal, and I didn't feel any different fishing against him as I did thrift and scott and dudley and those guys so is it you against the fish or do these guys even matter no it's it's against the fish i don't care who i'm fishing against you know it's as simple as that are you a competitive guy though like Ab in in everything absolutely everything i do i want to win can you can you be a professional fisherman and not be ultra competitive is that po i mean is that a possibility uh i don't think so i don't think i don't think if you're if you're not comp if you don't have a competitive side and you don't like to win uh, why even do it like why even try i agree <laughs> i mean you should know right off the bat coming into this sport that if you're not competitive you're going to get your teeth knocked in yeah like do you get pissed afterwards that i mean like so you seem like in person you're like really mellow you're like measured in all of the bpt stuff and on watching you on the tour like you never see you spin out freak out yeah I mean, do you ha do you get amped up? Oh yeah, yeah. But it's more like after the day's over, and I'm starting to look back and think, you know, what what did I do wrong? Where did I mess up? Um, that's when I get frustrated. That's when I get more mad than anything. It's, you know, because 
I feel like I should be able to catch them seven days out of the week, regardless where I'm at. And when I don't, it's frustrating. You know, I, it just makes me angry. And it usually shows more after I load up, <laughs> get back to wherever we're staying, and then I'm, you know, re-rigging things going, dang, I really suck today. Talking about wow. re-rigging, I got a fishing question for you then. You're with uh, Yozuri now, right? Mm-hmm. Is this your first full year with the Yozuri hard bait line? Mm-hmm. They got a bunch of different baits, a bunch of kind of all, kind of off the wall cool looking baits. So for a professional angler, I don't think I've ever asked anyone this. Guys change hard baits, get new hard yeah. baits. What is the process? Okay, you get on Yozuri, you're now with Yozuri, you're now going to be fishing these for the upcoming season. How do you learn those baits, get familiar with them, learn learn when to do that at the beginning of the year? I mean, is that, do you just go to the lake with everything or how do you figure out what that line has to offer now? Um, well, what I did was when I started, you know, with them, I looked through the catalog um, and I just went from page to page and I was writing down what I thought looked good to me, what I figured I would use a lot of. And that's what I wrote down and that's what I ordered. And, um, you know, it's ended up that's pretty much what I've used throughout most of the year um you know that's I didn't just get in there and order one of everything they had because then I would have a boat full of stuff that I may or may not have used and then it would have just screwed me up in the head as far as I need to get rid of this I need to keep that it would have went against uh my cleanliness and trying to be (laughs) organized part so that's I just try to keep it simple and do it that way so your boat isn't packed it's completely oh, it is. full. Okay. Just organized full. Yeah. But it's organized. Okay. That's a difference. Because, I mean, you get a guy like Casey Ashley or Dean Rojas. Like, literally, there'll be, like, eight boxes in the boat. I, I yeah. wish I could do that. But then yeah. there's other guys to where it's, like, jam-packed. How do you find anything? In- <laughs> see, see, and that's kind of the way I should be, though, because I've got all this stuff. But generally, I always go back to using, like, a handful of things at every event but i but i don't want to be out there and not have something that might click and say hey do this so for me i want to have everything available even though i might only use the same longest stuff. thing you've kept in your boat without ever using it to where you're like i don't know why i keep this and then <laughs> one time you were like boom this is why it's in here hmm. probably like a big swim bait or something I always just keep in to think, man, maybe one of these days I'm going to use it. And I never pick it up. <laughs> uh, Mike in New York has uh, a really good question. Where did you learn to fish grass since Oklahoma doesn't have that many grass legs? Uh, Rayburn. Probably. Really? More than anywhere. I mean, I, I used to go to Rayburn at least two times a year for college tournaments or mm. uh, Rayovac or Costa something like that and it's not like i wouldn't consider uh rayburn as like a gunnersville or something like that or a florida lake with grass but it's got a bunch of it's got a bunch it's got a wide variety of grass Mm -hmm. um you know to try to get familiarized with Uh, and then just being able to travel in college and fish a bunch of different places really helped a lot too all right dan in pennsylvania wants to know what do you do to reset on the water when you're having one of those ugly days (laughs) <laughs> uh, so, probably sit down during a break and eat a lunch bowl and go damn i'm i'm not doing very good i need to change <laughs> are those breaks hard to get used to or are they like awesome i love them really? i get to sit down for 15 minutes and eat a snack and drink Regroup. about three waters real quick and start fresh huh as a, as a young guy do you like the business side of this gig do you like dealing with sponsors and everything that takes place off the water i do yeah you know it's there's good and bad to all of it and you know the business side is a lot of work um it can be frustrating at times but it can be also rewarding and uh you know you have to deal with both all right you're involved in several other projects what are some of those projects that you're involved with zach uh well my most favorite is probably hunting stuff um you know our foul militia stuff me and a group of guys um you know we just we just want to showcase what we do um when they're not at work when i'm not traveling fishing when we're home we're hunting you know just hanging out having fun Mm -hmm. um and it's it's 100 percent like it's not 
we don't want to show like scripted stuff it's not cut stuff it's it's a hundred percent real uncut you know just that's basically it you know we and that's all we've wanted to do we don't have we have some shirts and some hoodies that we sell and uh some youtube videos we put out but that's about it um it's more just to have fun and kind of share a passion with people um you know and then when i'm home and i'm not doing hunting stuff or fishing i'm doing dirt work uh with another one of my best friends he's my business partner too and yeah that's my bobcats parked out front right now as soon as i <laughs> get in here i've got to go do some dirt work so all right uh do you think matt that he would be willing to attempt the oklahoma hat trick do you remember what the oklahoma hat trick is yeah uh noodle a catfish this is all in one day okay. kill a pig kill a pig and ride a bull and ride a bull all in one day I don't know. That's kind of sketchy. <laughs> I've had this. I st- I came up with this when I was in my early twenties, mm-hmm. and I let the time pass me by. <laughs> so I, I'm out. I'm out for it because you have to have a, a select set of skills and youth to heal after that situation. Yeah, we're not talking bodacious here that we want you on the bull. I mean, bodacious. You're dating yourself. With I, know, that one. I know. I know. I know. I know. Uh, you know. But there's what uh, about like a three week time period where all that could could happen yeah. in yeah. one day. Yeah, you could do it. He doesn't. You don't <laughs> see too enthused. I'm not sure I'm up to par for that. <laughs> I'm not even sure I'm, I'm down to noodle anything. I don't like. You've the, never done that. No. Want well, no part of it. Absolutely oh, not. Dude, you gotta get out to Thunderbird. No, I don't feel like putting my hand in holes. I can't see what's. Have on you the ever been to the deal they have in Paul's Valley though? I haven't. The it's catfish pretty impressive. noodling championship. Yeah. Here's the crazy part. So Thunderbird, they call it Dirty Bird. And you get down, you noodle, and I, I put put uh, I put goggles on because I'm a dork. And you get down there, and like the bottom 18 to 24 inches is clear. It's huh. weird. That's different. Yeah, you wouldn't expect it. Uh, like it's clear enough to one time I was noodling, and I've only gone probably five times. So I was noodling with Jared Miller. And we found a finesse jig on a Thursday that I had broken off on a Wednesday night at the end of a ramp. Wow. Because <laughs> you could be like, oh, there it is. And I mean, the visibility is like yeah, coffee until you get down below. It's it's wild. That you is weird. You expect that. Yeah. All right. Uh, Mike in New York wants to know, what would you consider... Uh, hang on here. What would you consider the most useful tool that you have in your boat right now that would help you catch fish? Hmm. Or more important, you know, I'll even go a little extra and say what, what's probably been the biggest addition from a technology standpoint that has helped you in this game. Man, I, I would probably say the one – it's hard to pick one thing because you have – Well, say a couple. <laughs> well, you, you, ha- you have your rig um, with, you know, the best electronics, the power poles you know mm-hmm. best rods and reels and line and lures and stuff that you could possibly use to try to get a bite um you know in, in this year um maybe not the table rock events but you know as the whole year as a whole my power poles probably have been one of my biggest um tools that i've got to utilize um, because the whole year i fished dirt shallow in places rivers or you know chickamauga i fished in some stuff that i probably shouldn't have tried to get my boat into mm-hmm. um you know and just being able to put them down and and fish and not worry about drifting and things like that it's this year that's probably been a tool that has helped me more than anything one of the things i wanted to ask you about and i swear we're not like just like i'm not pumping his sponsors but this is a question i mean favorite has come on huge in the fishing industry over the mm-hmm. past couple years with the eggers that they spot so i mean you're wrapped with favorite now right yeah what is it like working with them and kind of what is the scene like b- b- with the favorite guys um it's good they're um uh, you know some people that i've worked with in the past and you know i know now but they're very open to changes and modifying things and and that really helps me out a lot you know there's a lot of things that i'd like to see modified or adjusted um not so much to perfect it but to make it better for 
how I like to fish and things, and they're extremely open to that. So um, it's been it's been good. You know, it's not something where they're like, this is the way it is, whether you like it or not. You know, that's the way it's going to be. Um, it's been good. Uh, let's see here. Phil Manchu wants to know, what about duck hunting? What about duck hunting? Are you into the duck hunting? That's about all I do for the next two and a half, three months. All right. Andy in Indiana wants to know, FG not or not? Not. I don't know how to tie that 10 minute long knot. What do you do? <laughs> uni to uni? Uh, used to. Now it's more like the uh, Alberto knot or Crazy Albright or whatever you want to call it. Or the Albright, it. okay. Yeah. It's just simple. It's strong. It's easy. I can tie it real fast. Yeah. I don't, I can't put my foot down to grab my line and yeah. grab it like this and do all that i was in the boat with aaron at that media event last month yeah and he's like taking his socks off he's like then you you macrame it around your big toe and then you pull it out here and then you make like a shadow puppet with this hand <laughs> and then spin around three times and you're done and i'm like no no all right this is kind of an interesting question david in tulsa here in oklahoma wants to know uh no information on the lake have no idea what are the first two lures that you're going to get out and try and throw? Oh, probably a, a, a square bill and a, a vibrating jig. That's probably the first two that I'll pick up um, because I'm covering water looking at things. Uh, once I get into an area where I feel like there's a bunch of fish and I can get bites, you know, and I know they're in there, um, you know, I may slow down and, and throw some plastics or something, but I generally, it's hard for me to do that. I just like to keep moving, keep, keep rolling. All right. Uh, Brad in Tennessee wants to know, can you make a comparison between the guys that you competed on the FLW tour compared to the BPT? Uh, you know, truthfully, they're all, they're all real similar. Um, you know, everybody's extremely competitive on no matter what um, format or where you're fishing. Um, that's really it. Who did you like when you were growing up? Did you were you even a fan of of somebody in particular? Was there a show that you? really had to watch every Saturday or, or were you even into that? Was it something that really didn't come to you until later in your childhood? Um, I liked watching the tournaments. Yeah. Um, you know, all the bass stuff growing up, of course. Um, and FLW, that was... I liked to watch the tournaments more than I did the fishing shows. Mm -hmm. um, I guess maybe because it's competitive more. Yeah. Um, and, I, and I can't really say that I liked one individual more than anybody else you know i just i really enjoyed watching it as a whole and um you know really the competitive side of it all right do you still like fishing around here fishing tournaments the team tournaments stuff like that would you get into that i don't really get to um i would love to i would love to have you know time in between to where i could come home and fish jackpots or things mm -hmm. like that and when i when i am home and i do have time and it's not hunting season I will fish uh, with buddies, you know, jackpots or something like that. But mm -hmm. usually after our last event, like I've got an event next week. After that, it's uh, I'll be hunting. And do I'll, you f do you fish at all once hunting season starts? If I do, I might go one time. All right. So do you don't use that time to like improve something or work on a tactic or So we will technique? not have late fall bass fishing tips with Zach Burge in any upcoming shows is what we're You're, saying. Hey, it's not unique. You're not the only guy that does that. There's a number of guys that do that. So what, you won't pick up or, or get on the water till January then? Pretty, pretty much, much, yeah. Wow. You know, what's odd is too, like the Rayback Championship I won was like in November. Um, I've had a lot of my a lot more success um kind of overall has been late late fall and if i don't have <laughs> if i don't have an event i'm not gonna fish i'm gonna be hunting mm -hmm. but if i do i've done well and you know i can't really say why that is which one would you say you have more passion for the the hunting or the fishing oh man uh 
the competitive side of fishing really drives me um but i enjoy hunting and hanging out with buddies and just being able to sit around and bs with them a lot too so it's like and i've said it too if i could make money hunting if i knew how to make money hunting and i could make a true living pay yeah. my bills i might sway that way a little bit more um but you know right now fishing's paying my bills and it's doing good so i'm going to stay there which is more difficult to reach the quote-unquote expert level at bass tournament bass fishing or hunting uh that's kind of a hard hard one to answer. <laughs> well i don't I hunt mean, i mean i feel like i feel like there's a lot of guys that hunt to say they hunt and they may not you know mm-hmm. it's not so much about going out and just killing everything that comes by it's that's not what it's about but you know at the same time when i go hunt i don't go hunt to just sit out there and bs that's that's part of it but if i'm not successful at doing that too it's like a bad day on the water i come home and i'm frustrated i'm like you know what do we do wrong how do we set up wrong today um you know and i take that to my next day of hunting it's it's kind of the same way it's weird but um I would say it's, it takes a lot of work in either uh, hunting or fishing to be successful at it. I know you have numerous, but what is one memory from a hunting trip that really sticks out in your mind? I didn't mean to stump you there. Yeah, you, you did too. <laughs> the toughest question in the history. I, 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 I really did. You know, I. I, I don't know. I guess I'm kind of looking. Have you ever killed a bear? You ever went on a bear hunt or anything like that? Or no, no. We went to Colorado last week elk hunting, and yeah, you know, we didn't. We had a lot of close encounters, and we hiked a lot, and we climbed a lot of mountains. Uh, that was fun because I've never done it before. Mm-hmm. I learned a lot last week. Uh, but you know, it's that was a lot of work. <laughs> <laughs> That's what perch does yeah cliff perch is like oh i just belly stalked this elk and a mountain lion was stalking me and it spooked the elk and he's like did you see that Mm-mm. he's oh, like yeah. on his instagram and he's like and there's the mountain lion and it's like this mountain lion standing there looking at him and he's like they don't like it when you make eye contact with them <laughs> and then he just goes back he's like yeah i was ticked off that it spooked the elk yeah that's 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 crazy yeah maybe he's a guy he's been doing that forever all right uh david wisconsin says when zach gets a new boat does he try and rig it the same way every year or do you try and do changes based upon the model um that's a good question um and and i do go back and forth i've run um a bass cat i've run cougars and eras but and i flip flopped back and forth um for years Last year was the first year I ran a Puma. Um, very little differences between them. Um, some handling characteristics and things like that, but I rig them real, real similar. I mean, I very seldom change up much. Um, probably the biggest difference would be going from an era to the Cougar Puma hole. I just prop it a little different, but that's about it. All right. Are you a tinker with your boat and with your tackle? I mean, do you like messing around with that stuff and getting in there and get your hands dirty? Uh, yeah. All right. A lot. Yeah. And his trucks. His trucks more <laughs> so than the boat and the tackle. Yeah. yeah. Like on the truck you're uh, you're driving out. Like how many? Okay, like you buy a truck off the lot. Don't go into all. It's uh, we'll be here another hour. How many <laughs> alterations or changes are on your current vehicle right now? Just number wise, ballpark. Um. Uh, six or eight significant changes very significant (laughs) not not just like throw this on there and call it good like i'm like hey i got a cover on my truck (laughs) it looks slick now (laughs) jeez all right man uh decent year decent season and uh wishing nothing but the best continued success on the bpt next year uh and and we'll see when the television shows come out how well you performed in the in the upcoming cups so uh excited to see that but best of luck to you man appreciate you coming in and uh we need to get you on here more often right down the road yeah there in bridge creek but uh matthew anything else no that's it you're good yep all right interested to see uh 
what goes on on 10 killer this week this might be the smallest full field venue in elite series history i was thinking i don't think they've ever competed on anything smaller than twelve thousand acres with a now granted it's only 75 boats but yeah, it's not a big place yeah might be the smallest lake in history you like 10 killer i do like 10 killer yeah i thought you would all right that's gonna wrap things up here folks another great week uh, i want to thank zach once again for being in studio next week uh, check out the schedule on Sunday night on BassNote.com. We'll have it out there. We're going to definitely discuss the 2020 Elite Series season and go from there. Matthew, what do you got going on this weekend? More? Uh, food, more? No, I'm going to be on the water three days, and then I'm going to go to Dodge City, Kansas one day. Guess what for? An 18-second <laughs> run. Correct. I hope it's a little faster than 18 seconds. Oh. <laughs> Girlfriend's 17? got a... Uh, 17 the, seconds? The, Is that good? The KPRA Finals in Dodge City, Kansas. It sounds, sounds like important. a lot of money. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> she can win some coins. All right. Very cool. Very cool. All right, everybody. Great week here on PTL. Make sure that you subscribe to us on YouTube. And what was it, Matthew? Press the little alarm thing the little, right there. The little uh, notifications button. That way it just pops up that a new show if you're one of the... One of the people who listens to us on YouTube uh, and not yeah. on iTunes. Then on iTunes, make sure you review us and rate us. That is valuable information for us. It helps us out tremendously. Everybody be safe. Have a great weekend. We're back on Monday. We're out of here. <laughs>